Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Join the Patreon to vote for Jenny from My Life as a Teenage Robot or Danny Phantom, and like and subscribe to become the one true king next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Arthur Pendragon. Originating from the mid-800s, this public domain dude is one of the most famous characters of all time. He's not just from the original legend, he's in anime, books, comics, video games, and even fairly odd parents, so we got plenty of sources to pull from. Whether he got his sword by pulling it out of a rock or from a lady in the body of fresh water, he's still a legendary hero who rules over Camelot. Might not be the simplest way to pick a nation's leader, but it makes a lot more sense than the Electoral College. And I say, hey, hey! Kind of Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need a special sword. So cool, it's being talked about 1,100 years later. We also need to be the kind of leader people can get behind. So charisma is a must. And you should be able to use that leadership to lead the party to victory, too. Finally, we need to be able to pull off feats of athleticism so impressive that millions of college students love to pretend they did their readings in English class for years to come. On to the stats now. We'll be using the standard point right from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want. Just don't forget about multi-classing minimums, otherwise a green guy will walk into your house and ask one of your friends to cut his head off. Trust me, you don't want that happening. Charisma at 15. If you're going to be the once in future king, you should make sure your approval ratings are decent. Set con to 14 to tough it out with the best of them. Strength at 13. If you're going to swing your sword, you've got to be able to pick it up. Dex at 12. Since a lot of your feats of legend have to do with incredible speed and nimbleness, this is actually kind of low. But int at 10 feels about right, since you've got a wizard buddy to do all the thinking for you. And wisdom at 8. You fail some insight checks on your wife and best friend. Whoops. King Arthur is a brand of flower, but that's not a race in D&D, so we'll go human, specifically a variant one. That'll let you boost your charisma and strength by one. Having so much variety means you can be an inspiring leader. That lets you give a 10-minute speech to some of your buddies, preferably given in a table shaped like a circle. Six people within 30 feet of you gain a number of temporary hit points equal to your level plus your charisma modifier. So give a pep talk to Lancelot, Tristan, Gwaine, Bradley, Colin Mockery, and Ryan Stiles, and they'll get extra HP. Also grab acrobatics for your bonus proficiency. You can stay on your feet in battle. Take the folk hero background for athletics and animal handling proficiency. If you can't befriend a horse, you're gonna have to clap two coconuts together. So what class could possibly encapsulate the most legendary hero of all time? He might not be a Batman villain, but I'm gonna make him a bard. That'll let us grab proficiency and intimidation to be as daunting as you can be. Religion to help you on your quest for the Holy Grail. And insight to know that when a green fellow walks into your court, you don't cut his head off, no matter how much he asks. Personally, if a dude walked into my house, house and said, ooh, please cut my head off, Mr. Please. I want to be decapitated. I wouldn't do it, but that's just me. I'm built different. As a bard, Arthur gets bardic inspiration. That'll let you use your bonus action to give a creature within 60 feet of you a d6 they can use within the next 10 minutes to boost the total of an ability check, attack roll, or saving throw. That'll let you lead and support your round table in and out of combat. Like no one else could, a number of times per long rest equal to your charisma modifier. So three times per day at the moment. But that's not all. You also get spell casting. You can cast spells like Blade Ward to give yourself resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for that Arthurian invulnerability you're so well known for. Thomas Mallory wrote that Excalibur once glowed with the brightness of 30 torches, so that gives me permission to give you the light cantrip. So you can make your sword shed a bright light in a 20-foot radius and a dim light for an additional 20 feet. For your first level spells, go with Heroism to give yourself or an ally immunity to fear and temporary HP that regenerate at the start of their turn equal to your Charisma modifier. You can't stack that on top of the hit points from Inspiring Leader, but if you don't have 10 minutes for a speech, you can use this to bolster you and your buds as long as you concentrate for one minute. Long Strider will help you boost your movement speed by 10 feet for an hour, helping you achieve those crazy feats of speed. Bane will make people nervous because they're fighting a legendary warrior. That'll force three creatures of your choice to make a charisma saving throw. On a failure, they'll have to subtract a d4 from attack rolls and saving throws. And Command lets you use your kingly status to issue an order to someone, and they'll have to make a wisdom save, otherwise they'll have to follow it. If King Arthur tells you to do something, you'll probably do it. Unless he's saying, please chop off my head, then maybe I don't know. Maybe not. Second level bards get jack of all trades, letting you add half your proficiency bonus to any skills you don't have proficiency in. That'll help us cover the untrained skills, so no matter what you're doing, you're going to be one of the best. You also get Song of Rest to let your allies heal an extra d6 of hit points on a short rest. There's nothing in the rule book that says the song has to be good. I imagine 12 dudes who like to hang out and drink beers and go on quests together just kind of rock out sometimes. As for your spell for this level, Excalibur's Hilt was said to keep its wielder from bleeding or being killed, so we'll take Cure Wounds to let you heal 1d8 plus your Charisma modifier with an action to represent that. 
Third level bards get to go to college, and wouldn't it be funny if we went with sword bard? You are the sword guy after all. But valor makes a lot more sense. That'll not only give you proficiency in medium armor, shields, and martial weapons, but it'll also give you combat inspiration. That lets a creature use your bardic inspiration die for damage rolls with a weapon, or they can add it to their AC when they're attacked. So now your leadership can help your round table in all phases of combat. You also get expertise in two skills of your choice to double your proficiency with them. Go with athletics and acrobatics to make sure no one will be able to outperform you on the battlefield. As for your spell at this level, use Karn Wenin to cast invisibility and disappear before your enemy's eyes. Last for up to an hour or until you make an attack, cast a spell, or break concentration. If Bard isn't going to be enough to build Arthur, we need a very special relationship with a cool sword that for some reason grants you impressive power. Whether that power is magic or the right to rule over an entire nation, there's only one way to do it, and that's with Warlock. Specifically, a Hexblade for Hexblade's Curse. That'll last a minute and let you call out to one creature within 30 feet of you and give you a bonus to your damage rolls equal to your proficiency. You'll crit on a 19 or a 20, and you'll regain hit points equal to your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier when you defeat them. You can also become a Hex Warrior, letting you use your Charisma modifier for your attack and damage rolls with Excalibur. Now that sword's going to boost your combat abilities way beyond what you could do with your own strength and skill. But of course, you also get more spells as a freshly minted Warlock, so pick up friends to boost your already impressive interpersonal skills. It'll give you advantage on Charisma-based checks with the target of a spell for the duration, but just know that afterwards they'll be mad at you for using the magic on them. True Strike, on the other hand, will give you an opportunity to remind your audience that the global water crisis is no joke and we're rapidly running out of accessible drinking water. Not only do we as individuals need to be mindful of our water usage, but we need to hold lawmakers and corporations accountable for their role in the dwindling of basic human necessities. Also, it lets you use your action to get advantage on an attack next turn. Don't use it, just use your action to attack twice. You can also use Expeditious Retreat for another option to boost your speed, letting you dash with a bonus action while you maintain your concentration for the next 10 minutes. Retreating isn't really your style, but nothing in the spell actually says you have to run away. Cast this and get closer to your enemies. Didn't think of that, did you, Jeremy Crawford? Also take Wrathful Smites to power up your next hit. That adds 1d6 psychic damage to an attack roll and forces whoever you're attacking to make a wisdom saving throw to avoid being frightened until your spell ends or they manage to succeed on the DC by using an action. King Arthur is a fighter of legendary renown. It makes sense that people fighting him would get a little scared. We're multi-classing spellcasters here, but it's Warlock, so it plays nicer. You just have extra slots that you would get from being a Warlock in addition to your Bard spells. Second level Warlocks get Eldritch Invocations, which are like tiny little feats that aren't as good as the big boy feats. Take Beguiling Influence to gain proficiency in Persuasion and Deception checks. Now we've got the social skills we need for the build without having to miss out on some other proficiencies that Arthur needs. Eldritch Mind is another fun invocation that gives you advantage on checks to maintain concentration on spells, which is going to come in handy considering a lot of your spells are going to require your focus. As for your spell at this level, why not take Protection from Evil and Good? That'll protect you from Morgan Le Fay. It gives Aberration Celestials, Elementals, Fiends, Fey, and Undead at disadvantage on attack rolls against you and protects them from being charmed, frightened, or possessed by those creatures. I know family drama can be a bit tough, but maybe if you and Morgan just tried to talk things out, you wouldn't need to cast this. Now that we've got some powers from our sword, what if we got a little holy in here with a paladin? That'll give you a lay on hands, a pool of hit points equal to five times your paladin level you can use to heal yourself or an ally, or you can spend five to cure a disease or a poisoning effect. We've also got divine sense to be able to send celestials, fiends, or undead within 60 feet of you. I don't know if that's really in character, but if you want to read every piece of Arthurian legend to double check, you can do that, but you can't leave a comment complaining until you've read every piece of Arthurian legend. I'm sorry, those are the rules. Back to Bard, it's our first chance at an ability score improvement at total level level 7, so you know I'm taking it. Boost your charisma up by 2 points for better saves on your DC, more inspiration, and better weapon attacks. As for your spell, grab Enhance Ability to give yourself advantage on whichever ability score you pick. On top of that, if you pick Con, you gain 2d6 temporary hit points. Your carrying capacity is doubled if you pick Strength, or you don't take Falling Damage from 20 feet if you pick Dexterity. Let's kick it back to Paladin now. You get to pick a fighting style, and since Excalibur is the greatest weapon, let's take the great weapon fighting style. So when you roll a 1 or 2 on damage die while wielding it, you can re-roll that die. You can also grab some spells like Divine Favor to add 1d4 radiant damage to your attacks, adding a little more holy oomph to your hits with the holy sword. Ceremony will let you do a bunch of things, but basically you can bless water, give someone a bar or bot mitzvah so they can roll a d4 on ability checks for the next 24 hours, or a different kind of ceremony that gives them a d4 on saving throws. You can even marry a party member to boost their AC while they're near each other for the next seven days. There's more, but we're not really going to cast it that much since we got Divine Smites now. Now let's see spend a spell slot to add 2d8 radiant damage to a hit and even more if you use some bigger slots. This will be your bread and butter. Save it for when you critically hit so you can double that damage and you're twice as likely to get critical hits with Hexblade's Curse. Just know that now we've multi-classed Bard and Paladin, you need to check page 165 of the player's handbook to figure out how many spell slots you have. Third level Paladins can pick a Sacred Oath and nothing says King Arthur quite like the Oath of Glory.
story. That'll let you channel Divinity with a bonus action to become a peerless athlete. With that, for around 10 minutes, you'll have advantage on athletics and acrobatics checks. You can carry, push, drag, and lift twice as much weight as you should, and your jumps are increased by 10 feet. Now, no one will be able to compete with you and your athletic prowess. Except me, of course, because I'm strong and cool and sexy and great. You also get Inspiring Smite, letting you use your channel Divinity after you use your Divine Smite to gift out 2d8 plus your Paladin level and temporary hit points to anyone within 30 feet of you. So if your Inspiring Leader hit points have run out, you can top yourself or your party members off when you lay down the hurt on an enemy. Fourth level Paladins get another ability score improvement or feat. Let's just cap off our Charisma modifier for now for maximum damage and attack rolls as well as Inspiration and Spells. Fifth level Paladins get an extra attack at total level 11. Woof. Well, it's still nice since you'll be able to hit twice with one attack action. You also get some second level Paladin Spells. You can take Aid to boost your round table's hit points. Three creatures of your choice get five real honest to goodness HP that can be healed. It's not temporary HP, so it can also stack with Inspiring Leader. Magic Weapon will make a weapon magical giving it plus one to attack and damage rolls for an hour, depending on your concentration. Do you like how often I'm saying weapon, 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 weapon? Hopefully YouTube's demonetizing system doesn't mind me saying weapon a lot. Anyways, use this on Excalibur. Maybe boost Ron, too. Did you know that Arthur had a spear named Ron? That's what I assume stepfathers are named, not legendary spears. Back to Bard! You get a font of inspiration at level five of Bard, so now your inspiration die regenerates on a short or long rest, and you can support your buds even more. And you can support them even more, even more, because it's a D8 instead of of a d6. You also get a third level spell, but none of them are really speaking to me. Maybe motivational speech, but that's just another way to give out temporary hit points, and we've got plenty of those, so just use the spell slots for a smite. Back over to Paladin now. Sixth level Paladins get Aura of Protection, adding your Charisma modifier to your allies' saving throws as long as they're within 10 feet of you and you aren't unconscious. You should be within 10 feet of yourself, and with a maxed out Charisma score, your lowest saving throw is now plus four to Wisdom. You're now as resilient as you possibly can be. Seventh level Glory Paladins get Aura of Alacrity, which increases your walking speed by 10 feet, as well as any allies that start their turn within 5 feet of you. This isn't going to be the last boost to our speed, but it'll let you zip around the battlefield like none other, except a level 2 monk. But can a level 2 monk smite? No, didn't think so. 8th level Paladins get another ability score improvement or feat. Personally, I think we should boost our con to increase our HP and help us concentrate on our spells, though I could understand wanting to bump your strength for a better athletic score. 9th level Paladins get access to 3rd level spells, and the haste spell is on the Oath of Glory list, so you know I'm gonna take it. It's my favorite. That'll double your movement speed to 80, boost your AC by 2, give you advantage on dexterity saving throws, and you get an extra action to attack, dash, disengage, hide, or use an object. Running with incredible speed can take a lot out of you, so when the spell ends after a minute or you drop concentration, you have to take a round off of actions and reactions. Good thing you've got that Eldritch Mind Invocation to make sure you have advantage on concentration saves. That and Aura of Protection should keep you moving at top speed without worry. 10th level Paladins get Aura of Courage, protecting you and nearby allies from being frightened, which is fine, but let's move on to Paladin level 11 for Improved Divine Smite, which gives all of your melee weapon attacks an extra D8 of radiant damage, so now all of your attacks are backed by Divine Force, and you can make your enemies fall even faster. 12th level Paladins Paladins get our last ability score improvement or feat. Let's bump up our constitution again for as much stamina and durability as we can possibly get. For our final level, we're going to dip into fighter since the 13th level of paladin doesn't really do much for us. With that, we can grab another fighting style. Let's take defense to boost our AC by one whenever we're wearing armor, which should probably be all the time. This will just make you a bit more invulnerable, even though you aren't actually invulnerable. But there is actually only one way to be invulnerable, and there's no way I could have given Arthur 17 levels of wizard for a spell that only lasts 10 minutes. If you do get the hit though, you can use second wind to heal yourself 1d10 plus 1 because it's 1d10 plus your fighter level and this is our only fighter level because we're level 20. But now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you've got Divine Smite, a boosted critical hit chance with Hexblade's Cursed, and Haste for plenty of ways to cut down your enemies with incredible efficiency. You've also got maxed out Charisma that'll help you and your pals out with Inspiring Leader, plenty of spells, inspiration, and all of your auras. Finally, with temporary hit points, lay on hands, and some healing spells, you're going to be great at staying in the fight. That's not even mentioning you have almost 200 HP, so you're starting off strong and can heal it up. As for cons, well, you got several concentration spells, and can you only use one of them at a time, so you're gonna have to pick and choose. We also weren't able to boost our strength score at all, so our athletics isn't quite as high as I would want it to be. And finally, it takes way too long to come online. Your first ability score improvement is at total level 7. You don't get extra attack until level 11. That's not great. But you're the king of Camelot, the slayer of dragons, giants, and magical beasts. You've defeated entire enemies single-handedly with Excalibur and Ron. There's a reason that sword slipped out of the stone when you grab the hold, now go out there and prove it. Just try not to let any of your apprehensions grow. Otherwise, you might have to deal with more dread. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, subscribe for more. We make two videos every week. Join the Patreon to vote for Danny Phantom or Jenny Wakeman, and follow me on Twitch to watch me stream.